Pieces of Me, Rescuing My Kidnapped Daughters by Lisbeth Meredith Narrated by Susie Alphans Prologue Aftermath 2016 Sometimes I'm asked if I feel lucky. Usually it's after I've given a presentation about domestic violence or the adverse childhood experiences study. And in the context of, aren't you glad all the bad stuff happened when your kids were little? As though pre-birth and early childhood experiences are any less impactful. The truth is, I do feel lucky. But not because my kids were little when their father tried to kill me. I feel lucky because I survived, and so did they. I feel lucky because when he stole them years later and took them to Greece, I was still a young adult, with all the energy and optimism I needed to risk bringing them home. I feel lucky because I knew from living through my own kidnapping how important it was to right this wrong and was adept at developing a support network that would make doing so possible. I feel lucky that I recognized how much support the girls needed when they returned and I often did my best to get it for them. And I feel lucky that my daughters have forgiven me for the decisions, large and small, that I've made that were not in their best interests. But there are times when I don't feel so lucky. When I take one of my daughters to the hospital for a trauma-related illness. When I am the only parent to hear their joys and sorrows. When I must reassure them, now in their late twenties, that I'm all right and I'm still here for them after they become panicked when I've taken too long to return a text or call. When I'm on a date and I'm asked anything about my marriage or how involved my kid's dad is in their lives. I never wanted to be one of those crime victims whose identity revolves around victimization. Then last year, I filled out a grant application and listed my passions. Budget travel in foreign countries. Writing. Volunteering with literacy projects. All directly connected to surviving my victimization. I have my daughters. I have my passions. And all things considered, I guess that makes me better off than lucky. Chapter 1 Last Visit I brush Marianthi's hair as fast as I can without upsetting her. My oldest daughter, like so many firstborn children, seems in tune with my every mood since her birth. Just six years old now, she senses my wave of anxiety about her father's impending weekly visitation. Are you scared, Mommy? Marianthi's voice sounds like a munchkin's from the Wizard of Oz, as small and sweet as she is. No, sweetie, I smile. I just don't want you to keep Daddy waiting. You look beautiful. And she does. She's wearing her blue dress with a floral collar that matches her ocean blue eyes. A barrette holds her straight brown hair back neatly. I direct her to her coat and boots while I work on getting her little sister ready. I push Meredith's plump calf into her boot. She groans. Point your foot down, baby. Slowly, the boot slides on. I run my fingers through her wispy brown ringlets and inspect her round face for remnants of Rice Krispies. Meredith is the antithesis of her sister. At two, she lost her grasp on a helium balloon. She silently watched it float toward the clouds, then announced, God stole my balloon. At three... She told a bald man that he had a baby head. And now, at four, Meredith has learned she can belch as loudly as a college boy at a frat party. My daughters are absurdly cute. I'm not the only one who thinks so. I get requests for them to be flower girls at weddings from people I hardly know. Ready just in time, I tell them, as their father, Gregorios, Gregory for short, pulls up in his dented bright blue Jeep Cherokee. A male passenger I don't recognize is sitting next to him. I try to get a closer look. The passenger catches me, and I avert my eyes immediately. What guy would ride along with Gregory to pick up the girls? And why? Mama, will you pick us up tomorrow? Meredith asks. I dread the day she's able to pronounce her R's. I'll pick you up on the tomorrow after tomorrow, remember? But of course Meredith can't remember the court-appointed visitation schedule. She's only four, and her father's visits are irregular. She doesn't know that the court only recently lifted the supervised visitation requirement that had been imposed during a restraining order, 
or that I pick her and her sister up at their daycare for the express purpose of avoiding unnecessary contact with him. And she shouldn't have to. Neither of them should have to know the grim details of their parents' divorce. They're still little girls, after all. I feel as if I have spent my entire 29 years of life walking on eggshells. It's March 13, 1994, and I'm four years out of my violent marriage. But despite the passage of time, my fear of Gregory is as strong as it was the day in March 1990 when I got back up off the floor, collected my baby girls, and fled in a taxi. The scratches and strangulation marks healed after several days, but his parting threats haunt me. I would rather kill you than let you leave. That way, you'll die knowing the girls will have no mother and their father will be in jail. Leave, and you'll never see them again. I'll take them home to Greece. I have nothing to lose. That was by no means the first time Gregory had threatened to harm or kill me. Not even close. In our marriage, he'd isolated me from friends, taken my car, and at the lowest point, limited my access to food while I was pregnant. Eventually, he wrung my neck. All the while, he delivered the same message over and over. You are worthless, stupid, and helpless. I am the only person you have to rely on. Without me, you are nothing. But it was his threat to take the children and disappear to his native home in Greece if I left him that got to me. He knew I could never live without my children. I remind myself that our circumstances are different now. Yes, things are still hard. I have no family around to help with the girls or with the house. We live in Alaska, a place where one battles ice and snow and long periods of continual darkness, followed by short periods of constant light. It's a place best suited for those with money. Money to buy a four-wheel drive. Money to buy lots of insulation for the house. Fancy winter boots and coats and airline tickets to leave the state once or twice a year for a warmer climate. All of the things I don't have. But what I do have are two smart and healthy little girls who know how to respond if anyone, including their father, attempts to take them away from me. I have my long-fought divorce that includes provisions in our custody arrangement to prevent Gregory from making good on his threats. I've earned my journalism degree. I have a promising job, and I'm determined not to feign independence through remarriage and further dependence. We are out of low-income housing and off food stamps. There is no reason to be afraid. Don't forget your blankie, baby, I remind Meredith. I hand her the paper-thin quilted blanket with red teddy bear print and red fringe that she's loved since birth. Life for everyone around Meredith goes better when she has the comfort of her security blanket. While her sister is the sensitive, pleasing child, Meredith's attitude is that if she has to suffer, then so should the entire community. The doorbell rings. I hug the girls and open the door. Gregory is standing there in his hooded blue jacket and baggy khakis. His dirty blonde hair looks even thinner than it was the last time I saw him, and his cheeks more hollow. Though he's a half inch taller than I am, I outweigh my former husband by an easy 15 pounds, despite my frequent crash diets. This stupid fact has pissed me off over the years as much as the legitimate reasons I have to hate him. And yet, his gaunt look makes him appear more scary and desperate to me somehow. Gregory wordlessly takes Meredith's hand. She in turn grabs Marianthe's hand. They carefully step over the ice and snow that have yet to melt in the extended Alaskan winter, and Gregory lifts them into his jeep. They both look back at me before he shuts the rear passenger door. Goodbye. I love you, I call out. Bye, Mommy, they say in unison. Gregory glares hard at me before getting into the driver's seat. I return his gaze and smile brightly, refusing to defer to his intimidation tactics, and then shudder as the jeep disappears from view. I close the door, chiding myself. I hate being paranoid, but who is that guy with him? None of your business, Liz, I tell myself. Bad things always seem to happen when I question Gregory about anything, and it isn't illegal for him to have someone I don't know in the car. Just get over it. Time to prepare for the day ahead. I plan to take my friend Julie to lunch at a new restaurant for her 30th birthday and will force myself to enjoy the quiet time without the girls. It should be fun.